Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India this fourth lecture on the great experiments in psychology. In the previous lectures so far, we have discussed about the development of psychology from philosophy, physiology and physics and then we talked about the first experimental psychologists, primarily um, the people who developed psychology without even knowing that they were doing it and we spoke about Helmholtz, Weber and Fechner, though they were not psychologists, they have really contributed to the development of psychology as a science as of its own. And today, we are talking, uh, we are going to talk about Wilhelm Wundt, the founding father of psychology, who is known for uh, his uh, role in, he has a major contribution in the development of psychology and he has, he is the first one who had developed uh, psychology as a science in, in its own origin, in its own dis as a discipline of its own. So, um, and uh, he is finally known as the f uh, formal father of modern psychology. And in the in this slide, as you can see, we discussed this slide in the previous section also, uh, where we spoke about the development of the natural sciences in the 19th century, especially in Germany and there were techniques developed, apparatus devised and widespread uh, scientific uh, interest aroused in psychology. And uh, there were two wings of science, one primarily trying to understand the importance of senses and the other wing was trying to understand how the senses functioned. And this uh, the, had created the platform for the new science of psychology and we actually needed one individual to come forth and present it as a science to the modern world and Wilhelm Wundt took this responsibility. So, this brought about the new psychology. Now, Wilhelm Wundt uh, was, uh, one, one of his major tasks was about multitasking and uh, discussing about or thinking about multitasking. Wundt had never heard about the word multitasking. And this is a, a wonderful anecdote which goes like this that even if he had, he would not have believed it was possible. Um, say think about Moon's days, we did not have a, a mobile phone where one could actually uh, scribble messages along with uh, doing the task of driving at the same time. So, he, he did not, he would not have believed at even at that time that it was possible to pay attention to more than one stimulus or to engage in more than one mental activity at precisely the same moment in time. So, this is something that we often uh, come across uh, in the universities and college situations and also uh, while traveling on the road where people are trying to multitask, uh, talking on the phone or scribbling while traveling. So, um, at that point in time, though multitasking was uh, one area of research, it is a little surprising, but uh, this is the first thought that came to Moond uh, when he tried to analyze uh, David Kinnebrook's uh, performance. We will come to that. So, at that time, uh, Moond started his uh, research in uh, physiology. Uh, as a part time lecturer in the University of Heidelberg and he was teaching basic laboratory techniques to undergraduate students. But in his makeshift lab at home, he was attempting to conduct research to spark the development of the new science of psychology. Wundt came from a family of a lot of academicians, his father was a minister and he, uh, he had a very um, an unfortunate ill childhood. I would say that he was not uh, very, uh, he was not an achiever during his childhood. In fact, he had very poor interactions with people, but over time he overcame this and uh, he had developed a considerable amount of interactions with people. But um, his uh, research 
that is why he was more focused on uh, dealing with the mental processes. So, he had a makeshift lab at home where he conducted most of his experiments. And what interested Wundt primarily was um, a, a report on David Kinnebrook in way back in 1796. Uh, if you remember, we had spoken about David Kinnebrook. David Kinnebrook was, an, uh, was a very famous astronomer, uh, Maskelyne's assistant in 1796 and he was fired from his job because he was, he was reporting errors a tenth of a second um, on uh, the movement of a star. And Maskelyne, who was really impressed with his performance a year back, uh, Kinnebrook had served uh, his uh, superior for around a year. And um, Maskelyne found it really strange that in spite of being told, Kinnebrook could not change these uh, errors or correct these errors. So, uh, this performance change in Kinnebrook and these um, errors that uh, Maskelyne reported about Kinnebrook really uh, made Wundt wonder w about the personal equation. Fred Friedrich Be Bessel had written about the personal equation and Wundt was intrigued that the systematic differences between astronomers in their measures of the passage of stars across grid lines in telescopes. This actually there were differences between the astronomers and these differences he found were see there was a mere half a second di difference between Kinnebrook and Maskelyne and this depended on whether the astronomer first focused his attention on the star or on his timing device. So, Wood felt that one cannot multitask. So, if you are looking at the device instead of the star then you are losing a fraction of a second over there. So, this, um, so if the observer looked first at the star, he obtained one reading. If he looked at the grid line first, he made a slightly different reading. And it found out that it was impossible for the observer to focus his attention on both objects at the same instant. Now, Wood's interest in this problem led him to modify a pendulum, a pendulum clock that it represented both an auditory as well as a visual stimulus. And in this case, he had a bell and a pendulum swinging past a fixed point together. So, it would go like this and he called this Gedanken Messer, meaning thought meter or mind gauge. And he used to measure the mental process of perceiving two stimuli together. So, you what are the two stimuli? One is the auditory stimulus, the other is the visual stimulus and again it is a two stimulus moving together. So, here um, he found out that it was impossible to perceive two things at the same moment. So, there is a there is a bell it, that is that too is a visual stimulus though it is also giving an auditory stimulation. Along with that the movement of the pendulum it was impossible to look at the two stimuli together. One could either attend to the sound of the bell or to the side of the pendulum passing a specific point. The results of his measurements showed that it took one eighth of a second to register both the stimuli sequentially. To the casual observer the stimuli appeared to occur simultaneously, but not to the trained researcher. So, Wundt in his own way found out a way to measure the mind. As you can see that he it was seen that there was a subsequence or uh, for the stimuli for the responses to happen. So, they did not happen together. So, when you are either you respond to the auditory stimulus first and then the visual stimulus or to the visual stimulus first and then to the auditory stimulus, but one cannot do the two tasks together. But and he also found the quantitative difference between the two responses. So, what was the, the being even that being simultaneous, he found out the difference in time. So, this was the first measurement of the mind. Wundt was far ahead of his time. He said that consciousness holds only a single thought and a single perception. When it appears as if we have several percepts simultaneously, we are deceived by their quick succession. In fact, this is very true. Imagine you 
yourself listening to uh, the sound of um, uh, uh, singing a song while uh, biking down the road. It seems that you can easily do the task together, but say if you had an obstruction on the road and you had to stop your vehicle, then uh, you will see that the song that you were singing had stopped or say if you were counting while walking. So, there are two tasks and uh, you can always argue that I am doing both of them together, but one is primarily automated. So, you are actually following the other and most of the times one is subsequently followed by the other. They are not done simultaneously. You cannot focus on two things simultaneously. So, if it is specially if the stimulus is uh, tapping the same sense organ. So, it is not possible to follow two things simultaneously on the same sense organ also. So, what is what happens is we actually follow one the other becomes an automated response, but nevertheless if just as I mentioned that if uh, there is a say on the other hand if uh, if there is an ob obstruction on the road the song stops. On the other hand if there is a complicated note if I ask you suddenly what is the meaning of the song then the driving or the biking will stop to focus on the meaning or maybe you can topple down from your uh, bicycle. So, these are uh, so wounds uh, thoughts or wounds uh, ideas were uh, are yet still very relevant in our daily life. And we see that there is generally a poor performance on a cognitive task while we are multitasking. So, with uh, we will discuss about wounds uh, thoughts on psychology, but primarily uh, first we come to this point where wound was considered the father of modern psychology. And why was he done so? Primarily because he was the first one to declare psychology as a formal academic discipline. Mind you before this Helmholtz, uh, Weber, Fechner they had their own areas of research and these research had actually contributed to psychology on the whole, but they were not psychologists they did not declare themselves as psychologists nor did they wish to establish psychology as a discipline of its own. But and not only that they did not have laboratories dedicated to the science of psychology. Wundt was the first one to establish the laboratory in the University of Leipzig and he edited the first journal and he began experimental psychology as a science. So, the areas that he investigated are sensation and perception, attention, feeling, reaction and association. We will see how he went about that. So, that brings us to the question that why have the honors for founding the new psychology fallen to wound and not Fechner. We did discuss about Fechner's role in psychology and he uh, founded the um, science of psychophysics, the discipline of psychophysics where we understand that mental phenomena can be studied and mental phenomena actually is um, the it is not the direct it does not have a direct one to one uh, relationship with the um, physiological uh, phy with the physical phenomena, but definitely there is a relationship between the two and that can be quantitatively measured. Now, Wundt's contribution, but yet uh, Fechner is not called the father of modern psychology and Wundt is. Wundt's contribution to the founding of modern psychology stems not from the unique scientific discovery as from his vigorous promotion or selling of the idea of systematic experimentation in psychology. Fechner's objective was to understand the relationship between the mental and material worlds. We have studied uh, the mind body relationship as discussed by Fechner. He sought to describe a unified conception of mind and body that had a scientific basis, but Moon's goal was to promote psychology as an independent science as we have discussed earlier. And strangely David Kinnebrook who started it all way back in 1796 had no clue whatsoever that Wundt was going to use his error in astronomical findings as the root cause for the um, development of a new science of psychology. So, according to Wundt 
The work I here present to the public is an attempt to mark out a new domain of science. And this is where uh, what he wrote in the first edition of Principles of Physiological Psychology. We must of course remember that we, though we have been calling Wundt the father of modern psychology, he is not the founding father of psychology as a whole. Psychology emerged from a long line of creative efforts and as we have studied in the first class that psychology has its, uh, uh, had its uh, beginning um, centuries ago. But here we are talking about modern psychology and that is where uh, we must acknowledge Wundt's contributions. So, Wundt's primary area of study was conscious experience. What does Wundt have to say for that? It relied, Wundt's psychology relied on experimental methods of the natural sciences and especially at that time in Germany as you can well understand Wundt himself was also a physiologist. So, he was trying to understand the techniques used particularly by the physiologists. And there was a that uh, there was a movement in the science of physiology and philosophy and both these investigations helped structure the science and its subject matter. So, that is psychology. And so, you will see that most of the areas or the domains studied by Wundt were areas that were also studied by physiology as a subject. So, um, subject and the moon study of consciousness emerge from the study of consciousness or the study of the processes uh, of the uh, mind in physiology. So, um, he believed that we must understand the individual elements. So, the first step in the investigation of a fact must therefore, be a description of the individual elements of which it consists. So, Wilhelm Wundt believed that when you want to study a mental process, you have to break it down to its minimal core elements. Unless you understand the elements, you will not be able to understand the mental process. Now, if you can uh, see the influence of physiology. So, we were talking of a time where people were trying to understand how the sense organs worked and how they functioned. So, uh, he developed an idea called voluntarism. So, voluntarism came from the thought of uh, came from the idea of volition or action. So, the it is the idea that the mind has a capacity to organize mental contents into higher level thought processes. The elements of consciousness were basic. So, without the elements there would be nothing for the mind to organize. So, that is say for sensation, we would require a stimulus. So, without understanding the stimulus and its properties and the process of sensation, we would not be able to understand the sensation itself. So, according to Wundt, psychologists should be concerned with the study of the immediate experience rather than the immediate experience. Now, what does he mean by immediate and immediate experience? Immediate experience provides information about something other than the elements of that experience. So, while immediate experience is unbiased by the interpretation. So, see if we say if, if I show you a rose and you say that the rose is red, it implies an interest in the flower and not of perceiving the redness. So, that is a immediate experience. So, the, the rose is red is an idea that is already persisting in your mind and that is what he said that. So, that is a immediate experience. Immediate experience would be you are talking about the redness or you are experiencing um, what you are experiencing currently. So, so that he said that it describing the experience perceived the ro perceiving the rose's redness would be the immediate experience. An immediate experience is unbiased or untainted by any personal interpretation. So, what exactly uh, does he mean by this? That if uh, when we are talking of immediate experiences and not immediate experience, immediate experience mind you is what you are going through right now. Immediate experience as Wundt pointed out was something that has shaped your ideas about something. So, that is that has shaped your perception about something. So, 
uh, it would definitely be tainted by individual uh, differences or I should uh, not use the word individual differences, it would be tainted, definitely tainted by your one's own uh, previous experiences or own perceptions. So, this he said that psychologists should be more concerned about the immediate experience. So, what an individual is going through currently rather than um, you know what he has experienced earlier. And um, he speaks of, so Wundt outlined the goal of psychology, especially his goal as follows. So, he says, you, we must analyze conscious processes into their basic elements, discover how these elements are synthesized or organized, so how they work with each other. So, first you separate the elements and then you see how they work with each other and determine the laws of connection governing the organization of elements. So, how do they add on with each other and contribute to the development of this sensation. So, first we identify the elements that are responsible for uh, say a visual sensation. So, here the primary elements of seeing a ro red rose would be its color, uh, so would be, so that would be the redness of the rose, the texture. Um, the, um, uh, the light properties. So, all these individual elements he said, how do they relate to each other and how were they associated also and how does that give us the perception of a red rose. So, here uh, to understand conscious experience or the immediate experience, Wundt said we need to require the use of introspection or the method of introspection. And Wundt uh, therefore used, uh, he had a few laws to understand or um, uh, principles uh, to study introspection. And introspection, what does it mean? It, ex it is examination of one's own mind to inspect and report on personal thoughts and feelings. So, how can an individual do that? So, his he followed very stringent, stringent rules in his labs and his uh, students had to undergo a huge number of introspect, introspections to um, on various to explain uh, to explore the conscious processes. So, uh, and he was very uh, strict about uh, those laws that one need to follow one needs to follow during introspection. So, here he says that observers must be able to determine when the process is to be introduced. So, when the stimulus uh, is given to you and observers must be in a state of readiness or strained attention. So, you should be attentive. It must be possible to repeat the observation several times. So, um, you can, so that uh, the introspection can be followed again with the presentation of the stimulus and it must be possible to vary the experimental conditions in terms of the controlled manipulation, sorry about that, controlled manipulation of the stimuli. So, you can actually, you see that you can actually verify the, uh, uh, vary the experimental condition, change the redness of the flower or change the size of the flower in this case. So, or uh, say if you are um, touching um, rough surface or you are touching a hot surface. So, make it a little warmer than before, making it a little uh, colder than before and uh, exp uh, writing about the experience. So, here uh, when uh, again when Wundt is speaking about introspection or uh, the report subjective experience where uh, the, the, the experience which the individual uh, undergoes and uh, writing about the immediate experience, he would uh, he followed stringent experimental conditions. So, you see when Wundt was calling psychology an experimental science, he was very serious about it. So, it is not that you, um, uh, you call it a science and you follow um, without following any uh, laboratory conditions. So, he was trying to make his experiments more controlled and he was also trying to introduce an independent variable whose uh, value could be manipulated. So, changing the type and the quantity of the stimuli or the intensity of the stimuli. 
So, when Moon spoke of sensations, he suggested that sensations were one of two elementary forms of experience. Sensations are aroused whenever a sense organ is stimulated and the resulting impulses reach the brain. So, mind you he is a physiologist, he is talking about sensations and so obviously, he will talk about sensations from a physiological angle and he is talking about breaking it into elements. So, see he is talking, uh, so he is talking about the sense organ and how uh, the sensation, how is a sensation created. So, whenever the stimulus is um, sending impulses to the brain. So, uh, so stimulus arouses a sense organ and that sends an impulse to the brain. And these sensations can be classified. So, the resultant being the sensation. So, that is the, um, uh, the understanding of the stimulus by the individual after it crosses a certain threshold. And he says that these sensations can differ from each other from in intensity, duration and sense modality. So, obviously, when we are talking of different sensations, uh, uh, so it could be uh, because of the variation of the modality also. So, different sensations could mean that it is uh, in the same modality. So, it is a visual sensation, it is an auditory sensation say uh, with uh, different intensities, different frequencies. So, it one is a shriek note one is a more um, base note. So, on the other hand it could uh, differ in duration. So, a note uh, being presented for a longer time and uh, for a lesser time it could be one uh, which is more loud and which is more soft. So, it would vary in intensity and of course, it could vary in modality. So, you have an auditory sensation as well as a visual or a visual sensation or a tactile sensation. So, there the core stimulus uh, uh, the stimulus is actually um, arousing a particular uh, a different uh, sense organ. So, now Wundt see just think about this Wundt was talking about this in the 1870s. And here, even in the 21st century, we that is how we try and explain sensations. And various studies, several other researches have culminated from it. And we have seen there are changes in uh, that have come about with the progress of science, with the progress of neuroscience and uh, neuroscience emerging as a discipline on its own right. But uh, we uh, these these things were fundamentally started way back by the psychologists of that day. And these psychologists have actually uh, brought in the science of psychology. So, when uh, so it as an experimental science, they have tried to verify it, express it as an experimental science. So, Wundt recognized that there was no fundamental differences between sensations and images, because images are also see associated with the excitation of the cerebral cortex. We will see later that this theory is refuted and we there are people who are also studying images and especially uh, when we talk of Galton later, uh, who um, had uh, theories developed through uh, the study of mental imagery. So, Wundt also spoke about feelings and he says that feelings are another elementary form of experience. Sensations and feelings are simultaneous aspects of immediate experience. So, when we are reporting an immediate experience, we are actually trying to express our uh, feelings about it. So, it could be pleasant or unpleasant or also and also the um, in about the different elements in the sensory process. So, feelings are subjective complements of sensations, but do not arise from a sense organ. So, this is what uh, Wundt thought and sensations are accompanied by certain feeling qualities. So, as when sensations combine to form a more complex state, a feeling quality will result. So, he said that if, if it is if it is a very shriek note say, if it is a very shriek high pitch high pitch note which carries on for a long duration. So, this is an auditory sensation, there it would also arouse a feeling component in the individual who is going through that immediate experience. So, uh, so, that is what he says when he talks about sensations being accompanied by certain feeling qualities. And he spoke about a tridimensional theory of feelings, where he spoke about pleasure and displeasure, tension and relaxation and excitement and depression. And uh, here uh, he sp uh, again Wundt spoke about organizing the elements of conscious experiments experience. 
and this is where a very important topic that was later taken up by personologists uh, came up out and he spoke about apperception. Apperception is the process by which mental elements are organized. So, Wood said that the, the it is a unified uh, conscious experience that we talk about. We do not talk about an experience, an immediate experience in elementary parts. For example, when we look at an objects in the real world, our perceptions have a wholeness. So, we do not say, uh, we do not speak about individual sensations about uh, say if you are looking at a tree, we do not talk about the greenness of the leaves, uh, the brownness of the uh, wood. Um, or the tr or the trunk and the lightness of the breeze, but we generally report our visual experience as a whole. So you are either talking about uh, imagery, uh, a, a, a scene where you talk about the tree and um, uh, where there is a a bright um, a tree with uh, the different constituents of the tree and how you feel about it. So, it could be uh, many times we say it is a it is a bright tree which and I feel pleasant looking at it. So, you actually you talk about the sensations and feelings as a whole, but we do not uh, put it in elements. Though uh, see would not realize that uh, even though he is trying to break it into elements, the when the report that an individual, the reporting of an individual generally is an apperception of the mass. Now, this apperception, this uh, idea of apperception was later taken up by personal personologists when they developed their theories and we of course, know about the thematic apperception test which came up later by Madre. Um, so, it is apperception is an active process and our consciousness is not merely acted on by the elemental sensations and feelings we experience. Instead, the mind acts on these elements in a creative way to make it up as a whole. So, this concept of whole was also taken up by another group of psychologists later and they were primarily the gestaltists. Again, they spoke about seeing things, perceiving things as a whole. So, Wundt's theories were uh, very interestingly uh, the beginnings of uh, different areas or different parts of psychology. And now, talking about Wundt's leg legacy, we see that he began a new domain of science and conduct conducted research in laboratory uh, designed exclusively to understand psychology. This is very important and he I have been repeating this time and again, but this is very important to um, explain or to settle set up a science um, as in its own right. He published the results in his own journal and tried to develop a systematic theory of the nature of the human mind. And some of his students went on to found laboratories and continue experimenting on the problems by using techniques that Wundt set forth. And one of his most famous students we know was uh, E. B. Titchener. We will talk about Titchener in our next class. So, we see that at around this time there were other developments in England and in America. So, the, at this time in England, Darwin had proposed the theory of evolution, Galton began work on psychology of individual differences and these ideas influenced the another direction of psychology. And in United States, uh, some of Wundt's students, especially um, Titchener who travelled back, he was an Englishman who went back to England and since England was not uh, at a state to accept his views. So, he travelled to America where he settled in Cornell University and um, he was trying to explore his new science of psychology. He believed that it was all of Moon's principles that he was trying to uh, propagate and he developed some of his theories on his own. So, this, um, this was how Wundt had uh, created in the science of psychology and he had helped it to be propagated as a systematic established experimental science uh, in different parts of the world. Though the Wundt's ideas were not uh, taken up by most and later on there were new developments in psychology, but as we know for any science a new research comes up refuting the previous one 
or even uh, developing something through it, but it in no way uh, uh, de delineates or uh, what should I say de uh, degrades or degenerates the contributions of the previous explorers in that area. And in this case, I will say Wilhelm Wundt's contribution to development of psychology is uh, immense and we uh, will never forget his contribution. And uh, so, in the next class, we will talk about his students, Titchener, and of course, the development by Galton as well as uh, Darwin. Thank you.